Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see all of you out there and all of you who are joining us on Zoom. I think we even have someone coming to us from Texas and someone coming to us from their new home at um, Touchmark. Is that true, Joan? Joan's nodding. <laughs> Welcome. And I ring this bowl, which I will ring again. We ring this bowl this morning to acknowledge that these lands that we love are the ancestral lands of the Yavapai people, the Wipukepas, the Tolkepayas, the Kwevkepayas, and the Yavapai. We also acknowledge the connection that we have with all living things. This morning for our gathering music, we are going to listen to the water song sung in Mohawk and English by the Akwesasni women singers, a women's singing group originated from the Mohawk nation that is made up of young women, mothers, aunties and grandmothers. Good morning, everyone, again, and welcome to Granite Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Prescott, Arizona. I am Suki Jones, your worship associate this morning. And on this beautiful fall day, with maybe a hint of rain out there, I just thought we should all just kind of turn to each other and smile <laughs> through your masks, but just greet each other with a, a wonderful smile for this wonderful day. We're glad you joined us whether in person or in Zoom. This is the mission statement of our congregation. We are a compassionate spiritual community that celebrates diversity, nurtures the personal and spiritual growth of all ages, shares our gifts, promotes justice for all, and serves the world we live in. Please join us after this service for socializing in small groups in the sanctuary in Davis Hall, or for those on Zoom, you know how to get into your breakout rooms. If you're joining us for the first time, please check out our website at prescottuu.org for more information. And if you're here in person at the end of the service, there will be time to introduce yourselves and chat with members and friends. We thank our pianist, Lena Hubin, our choir director, Mary Lou Prince, our choir this morning, and all of our Sunday morning volunteers. Now is the time to please remember to set your phones on worship mode. Before the service, you've been viewing today's announcements on the screen, and they'll be back after the service. And you can also read them on the order of service, the weekly peak newsletter, 
on our website and in Reverend Patty's videos. Sandra Palacios, our faith development coordinator, is teaching ages five and older across the street at our faith development building. We begin our service in the Unitarian Universalist tradition of lighting the chalice. Our chalice lighter this morning is Tracy. We observe that the flaming chalice holds the elements of the four directions, earth, air, fire, and water. The lamp oil for earth, the air that feeds the flame, the fire we light, and the chalice itself, the cup, a symbol of water. We light this chalice for the web of life which sustains us, for the sacred circle of life in which we have our being, for Father Sky, Mother Earth, above and below, and all that is holy. So for those present in the sanctuary, please stand in body or spirit and sing with us the opening hymn. Is that right? That's you. I, it's in small print here. I knew it was you. If you're, if, you, if you're feeling good standing up, you can stay standing, but I will greet you before we, we sing. <laughs> good morning. And it does feel good to stand, I think. <laughs> Oh dear. Um, when our worship team gathered um, during the summer to think about this year, we were gathering at Suki Jones's house and we were looking out at the mountains and we were thinking of these words and we thought of many words, but the word that came to the top was gather because we thought that will be the good medicine <laughs> for the loneliness that we have felt during this pandemic. Each Sunday gathering has been an underlying theme for our services, but today it is rising to the top. It was underlying the times that we gathered outside. And in two weeks, we are going to gather at Willow Lake and we are today here in a building that has been renewed and is in the process of renewal. Today, we begin with the gathering words of Jacob Trapp, a humanist who often spoke of God. Worship is a loneliness seeking communion. It is a thirsty land crying out for rain. Worship is kindred fire within our hearts. It moves through deeds of kindness and through acts of love. Let us rise now and join those who have already risen in body or spirit. And let us sing, gather the spirit. Witness the 
Thank you. That was great. I loved the singing. And those of you who love to sing, consider talking with Mary Lou Prince after this service. Would you stand, Mary Lou Prince? <laughs> and talk with her about joining our marvelous choir. Those of you on Zoom as well, we'd love to see you. And I know Judy would do anything to be able to be among us. I'm looking at you, Judith Davis. And we are hoping that your jailers start wanting to give you the key. Let us say together now our covenant. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community, thus do we covenant together. And now, let us breathe together and enter a different kind of time. We have busily brought ourselves to this place, hurrying to give our dogs a walk before we came, got into our cars. And now let us breathe and consider all that is on our hearts and on the hearts of all in our community. We gather together each week, all of us carrying, each of us carrying our joys and sorrows. As we experience this time, let us keep this feeling of connection. Let us feel the earth under our feet, this earth where we love to, to find solace and find energy this earth, the many layers down to its fiery core, and the sky above us, the ravens that call from the trees, the trees that are breathing, that are giving us sustenance. Especially today, we hold the people in Thailand who are mourning as we have mourned the great loss of children and parents in a shooting. We hold the people of Ukraine. We hold the many in Pakistan still searching for ways to, to make a home in the midst of this great flooding many who are, have loss of food. And I'm asking Suki, could you add, I would like to put a stone in, especially for Sister Anne, who is a Lovejoy um, recipient in our congregation. She fell on Tuesday morning and broke her hip. And the surgery to repair her hip was that evening but since then she has developed very serious breathing problems and she is now in St. Joe's in Phoenix in an ICU unit. She, those of you who don't know her, she is an Irish sister, Catholic sister who is a force in this community. We also add stones for Ken Briefer Kat Euler, Dan Reardon, and Eric Day, and for Suki, Jones, and Fred Krauss, who are recovering from a car accident, even though she's with us today and looks perfectly fine. We think she deserves a pebble in our water. <laughs> And now I invite you, as you listen to some meditative music, to come up and add a stone for anything that is on your hearts and minds. And I'm going to add one for my brother's um, 
son, Josh, and wife, Rebecca, who are going to go through a C-section tomorrow morning. The first grandbaby of my brother, David. Two, there's twins. The first grandbabies. And she's like, I'm done. <laughs> children and for a son and who is in his new home Are there names you would like all of the community to hear or messages of joy or sorrow? Oh. And I also have one from Annette Skellinger. Um, the skin graft for the open wound that my friend Hazel has had for over two years is, has been deemed successful. And I apologize for not asking for this earlier. Um, Allie holds her children and um, Daryl holds his son who has a new house. Isn't that right? They're moving into a new place. Yes. Is there anyone on Zoom who wrote something? Let us breathe again together. Please join me in a spirit of meditation and prayer. Spirit of life, great spirit who resides in the skies and the clouds and the trees and the ravens call. We ask for comfort during these times for the many in this world who are experiencing sorrow, we also ask accompaniment for their joy. We ask for special blessings in this community for those who have been named, for the, all those many in our community who are feeling the loss of a loved one. We ask for comfort. In your many names we pray. Amen. And now let us sing together, walking, walking with you. Walking, walking with you, walking with you. 
As the offering is collected, please join in this ritual of giving so that we may continue to have a place that strengthens and challenges us in these trying and troubled times. This haven, this refuge, this place of worship and wonder exists because we make it so with our contributions. The gifts of our time, our skills, our food, our love, our laughter, and our money. We also give back to the greater community through our Seeds of Support program. This month's recipient is Granite Dells Preservation Foundation, organized to help preserve the Granite Dells through fundraising and education. You can read more about them on the screen in your order of service. And uh, to give online, the link is available in the chat, or you can go to the website. Please enjoy our offertory music, Sunshine on My Shoulders by John Denver. We acknowledge the generosity of spirit expressed through these offerings. What is given in love is received in gratitude. Blessed be. In every part of the earth, we find suffering as well as joy. In the Sonoran Desert borderlands shared by Arizona and Mexico, migrants cross in the darkness. Many die without water. And in our cities, in this city, people without homes carve sleeping places where they can. 
under bridges and park benches, into the darkness that can surround those lonely evenings. We ask for comfort. We pray for safety and for a way to make a difference. Whether the voice calls to you to reach out your hands, from if it calls to you from the desert wind or from deep within your own mind, let us tune our ears to the voices that urge us to open our hearts and minds. Wind in the desert. Today, we are celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day by opening ourselves to a way of thinking, a way of be believing 
that is shared by many indigenous peoples, that the earth is sacred, that trees and animals and clouds and humans are imbued with a source that has many names, the great spirit, Wakantanka, God, spirit of life. We are celebrating today because tomorrow used to be and still is in many places, especially on my iPhone that gave it to me three times, Columbus Day, a celebration of the coming of Christopher Columbus on August 3rd, 1492. Columbus and his crew set sail from Spain and the three ships, remember their names? The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And on October 12th, the ships made landfall on one of the Bahaman, Bahamian islands, likely San Salvador. Columbus kept a detailed diary during his first voyage, recording his initial impressions of the local people and his argument for why they should be enslaved. They were well built, he wrote, with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and they have no iron. They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. I don't think that's something we should celebrate. Do you? And then in 1493, Pope Alexander VI issued a papal bull or decree, inter cetera, in which he authorized Spain and Portugal to colonize the Americas and its native peoples as subjects. The decree asserted the rights of Spain and Portugal to colonize, convert, and enslave. It also justified the enslavement of Africans. This mindset that Columbus brought to these places that were new to him resulted in the genocide of many indigenous peoples living on this land. So today, by celebrating the indigenous people, we are holding to that arc of justice that does not move on its own. By shifting the narrative from praising the conquistador to lifting up the magnificent array of cultures that were flourishing here and the many who at seemingly impossible odds are surviving and even flourishing in this day. I wonder, I wish we could have a conversation now about what you consider to be your theology and what image you have when you hear the word God or great spirit. Perhaps after our service, I'm going to ask you to talk about these things with each other. I, th I hope that we will have time to express these images that we have to each other. For now, I just invite you to sit with me for a moment. Imagine your favorite outside place that maybe has a far view or a grove of trees and looking up like I look up when I park my car in my parking space outside. That's one of my favorite places. Look up and I see that magnificent tree that is sheltering that space and covering my car with leaves and filling me with wonder. 
When are you filled with wonder? When do you feel that mystery? For the Lakota people, the great spirit or Wakan Tanka is the concept of a life force, a supreme being or God. And while this concept is common to a number of indigenous cultures in the United States and Canada, it is important to remember in this moment that it is not shared by all indigenous cultures or necessarily interpreted in the same way. Indigenous cultures are not monolithic, just as we Unitarian Universalists understand very well. According to the Lakota activist Russell Means, a more accurate translation of Wakan Tanka is not great spirit at all. It is the great mystery. Chief Luther Standing Bear of the Lakota Nation put it this way, from Wakan Tanka, the great spirit, there came a great unifying life force that flowed in and through all things, the flowers of the plains, blowing winds, rocks, trees, birds, animals, and was the same force that had been breathed into the first man. Thus all things were kindred and were brought together by the same great mystery. All things were kindred and brought together by the same great mystery. Gaylene Krauser, a member of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe, describes this theology as best fitting the designation panentheism. She says, if you're thinking about things from a spiritual perspective, from that perspective of panentheism, it's an everyday thing. You have to consider your relatives. That, just, that doesn't just mean your family unit, that means all other living things, and even things that others don't consider living, like the water that was celebrated in our opening, and the stones, those boulders around Watson Lake. We consider those to be more than inanimate objects. When, for instance, Krauser says, we belong to the land, she is expressing a primary way in which indigenous people think about their relationship to nature. In white European and American culture, we are more likely to think the land belongs to us. We have recorded legal deeds and other documents that prove that is true. But indigenous people don't think about going out into nature, she says. Rather, they recognize that they themselves are always a part of nature. How many of you have experienced being a part of nature? I remember as a child, we loved to play hide and seek. And I had a way of disappearing into tree trunks <laughs> so that no one could find me. Um, I think that was probably my first experience of oneness with nature. And on Wednesday afternoon, right here, we showed a documentary, one of the episodes, I hope some of you come this week on Wednesday, but it was on the complex history of Unitarian Universalism. And we've just seen the first two, and there are four more. Um, but among the stories we heard, there was one, there were, there were a few of people who died for their beliefs in the oneness of God or Unitarianism. And one was a woman named Katarzyna Veglova, who was born in 1460 
and died April 19th, 1539. And she was almost 80 years old. She was a Polish woman who was burned at the stake for not recounting her Unitarian beliefs. And after the, the film, we were talking about it and Marianne Clark remarked on how it is unusual rare in these times that people are willing to give up their lives for their beliefs. And then the next day, the New York Times had an article that I imagine some of you read. It was reporting that in the last decade, at least 1,733 people have died defending the environment. And there was a photograph that went with it of a man standing in front of a bulldozer in the Amazon with his arms stretched out. Many of these people were indigenous. Over two thirds of those deaths recorded by Global Witness happened in the Amazon rainforest. This concept that the world around us is sacred, that all living beings hold a spark of God, is the belief that I came to through many years of searching. When I was trying to make sense of my experience of wonder in the world, it came to me about 10 years after I had completely rejected the religion of my ancestors, where there was that very judgmental man with the beard who, um, who they said loved me, but it didn't feel like love. But when I came to that belief, mainly because we moved to the countryside, and it felt to me from the beginning that God was in those trees that surrounded us that surrounded um, the places where we walked, the bamboo forests, the cedar forests, the broadleafed forests that smelled so beautiful with the change of the seasons. And articulating the sacredness of all things resonated with me because it it felt like it gave me a way to be in the world, a way to be on this earth. And I wonder what I would be willing to give my life for. Would I be willing to stand in front of a bulldozer threatening a tree I found sacred? I wonder if I would be willing, what I would be willing to do to live my life in better alignment with my beliefs. I wonder what you would be willing to give your life for. In this moment, with the effects of climate change all around us, seemingly in every news we read, do you feel that? The flooding, these huge storms, the fires. I think that, that holding the earth as sacred can move us from the fear-based decisions that can be made to love-based decisions. Holding the earth as sacred becomes that grounding that helps us prioritize the overwhelming array of choices we make each day about how we face this world. In our kitchens, treating the food we eat as sacred, Lou and I have been led to a practice of eating up, which comes from my parents who grew up in the depression, eating up everything from our refrigerators unless it is positively impossible. <laughs> and then, composting the scraps. There always is that bit of cheese in the back of the refrigerator <laughs> that just cannot be eaten. 
And I know that many of you feed your chickens with the excess. But this practice has lightened our lives and in combination with long walks in the forest has brought us something like joy, which I will admit to you in this moment, joy has been a little more difficult for me to find in the past years. I don't know if, if it's the pandemic, but I have found that being in nature is my best chance for it. I think that holding the earth as sacred is one of our best chances for joy because we are opening ourselves not to a one way love, but to reciprocity that I described last week when I told you about climbing up to the water tower and listening and hearing thank you as I looked out at Granite Mountain. So yesterday I went up again and I was hoping I wouldn't hear the same thing because I think that would be boring. And I don't think nature is boring, but I wondered what I would hear. So I climbed up to the top of the water tower again and I sat there on that bench. And as I looked out, I heard from Granite Mountain, look at me. Light was coming through the gray clouds, and that mountain was decked out with light, like a teenager in a prom dress. Look at me! And I did for a long time, letting my worries move out into those thick clouds. And then later, did you see the moon last night? Look at me, that moon was saying. I think that was the message yesterday. The sacredness of the ponderosas and the moon and that mountain, that mountain that has given this congregation its name, that is the easy part of panentheism for me. The hard part is this. Humans are also considered to be sacred. And we are nearing election time. And I charge all of you, I had, and I hope, but I'm, I'm telling you to do this, to vote. Because this is a very important place where we live out our values. And later I'm going to be sending you a link because you, you, the vote has an actual fun event at 3.30 today that is all geared towards voting and getting everyone out to vote. In her new book, Braving the Wilderness, Brene Brown, who has been a great mentor to me, wrote, and if our faith asks us to find the face of God in everyone we meet, that should include the politicians, <laughs> media, and strangers on Twitter, oh, with whom we violently disagree. Ah! <laughs> Do you guys find this easy? These are not easy words. She continues, when we desecrate their divinity, we desecrate our own and we betray our faith. When we desecrate the divinity of others, even people we hate, we don't have to invite them to dinner. I feel like at least I have to say that. But when we desecrate them, we desecrate our own and we betray our faith. It is hard to hold the people we disagree with as sacred, but let us challenge ourselves to be aware during this time of the way we talk about people, 
with whom we disagree. Just as a ponderosa pine, they too deserve our respect. Whether it is from a belief that things are sacred or whether it is from our first principle, is it over there? <laughs> anyway, our first principle that calls us to see the inherent worth and dignity in every person. Did you get the every person? <laughs> Not see the worth and dignity of everyone we agree with. I wonder when Columbus landed, what a different story we would have if he had believed that the, these strange people he met and the land under his feet were sacred and worthy of his respect. If he had done that, we would celebrate Columbus Day. May we together have the strength and imagination to shift the narratives of history and hold sacred that mystery that is in all things and that resides in each human. Amen. And may it be so. And now in honor of that divine light within us and all people, we will sing with gestures that Mary Lou Prince will lead us in this little light of mine. So you guys who are here, you don't need to look up here. She'll let you know what's going on. <laughs> Join me in a spirit of prayer. Great spirit, mystery that we feel in Granite Mountain all decked out for a dance. We ask to see that great mystery, that light, that spark of divinity in all things and all people. May we go through these next weeks with joy. May we find new words for our enemies that hold sacred their divinity. May we walk on this earth with our first principle withholding 
that respect for the worth and dignity of all living things. We ask these things in your many names. Amen. I've asked you to do something really hard. <laughs> but I think you could try to make it fun. Um, and I'm trusting that you will. And now it is the time here to ask anyone who is visiting to, to who they are and to meet each other. But that is not interesting for you on Zoom. So we are going to extinguish our chalice and let our people on Zoom go to their um, breakout rooms. And so let us extinguish our chalice and then we will meet each other. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you, all you people on Zoom. And Judy, I'm counting on you to be able to break out next week. <laughs> Or the week after, I'm not here next week, but, uh, but sometime because we want you back in our choir. Yeah. And, and in two weeks, we are at Willow Lake. There will be a service on Zoom. And um, I think it will be projected here for anyone who, um, who comes and doesn't know about Willow Lake. So, um, and if you need a ride to Willow Lake, um, let, let me know or when there's an email sent out, you can contact that. So we can make sure that we're all there enjoying um, what I think feels like the land of the great spirit looking out at that lake. <laughs>